Hi, my name is Preston Satoris. I am currently a fourth year medical student, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, pediatric epilepsy. And so this is going to be part of the uh, Psychiatry and Neuroscience video library series. This series was developed to create a uh, resource to help providers and personnel support young children with or who are at risk of developing social, emotional, or behavioral uh, problems. And so hopefully this will be helpful for those of you who are watching. So let's get started. First, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Kevin uh, Simonson for um, d developing these slides at first, and they have been edited with his permission. So thank you, Kevin. Learning objectives. So first of all, we want to learn about the different types of seizures, simply put. Then we want to learn about how to take care of children that have those seizures. And finally, we're going to learn about the treatment and side effects the medications for those seizures. So, what are seizures? Few healthcare problems elicit more distress than witnessing a child having a seizure. It can be scary, terrifying to many. And when the victim is a child and the observer is a parent or caregiver, that terror can become panic. So, there are a lot of events that mimic seizures. Um, first of all, uh, the child could have a loss of consciousness, uh, potentially a migraine. They could also have sleep disorders or parasomnias, um, pseudo seizures, which are actually non epileptic seizures. They look like seizures, but they actually aren't. Um, some children do breath holding. They'll just hold their breath when they're like really angry or uh, emotionally charged. And the way they might act afterwards or go out of breath or look blue in the face might think, uh, make you think, oh my gosh, they're having a seizure or there's something's happening to them. No. Uh, ticks can also happen, um, whether that's motor ticks or verbal ticks, basically repeating the same motion or um, uh, verbal utterance over and over again. Um, that can look like a seizure. Shuddering, just, just like shaking a little bit. Um, rigors, again, shaking. Uh, all of these can look like seizures. But really, seizures are um, specifically a type of abnormal neuronal activity. Uh, it's uh, in scientific terms, a sudden biochemical imbalance at the cell membrane um, where there's repeated abnormal electrical discharges. Uh, really all you have to know if that all seems like scientific mumbo jumbo is there's something that's happening uh, at the um, cell membrane that's causing you to do these repeated uh, motions as exemplified by these uh, this wonderful clip art here. So what do you see when you see a seizure? Uh, parents or caregivers may report seeing repetitive, non-purposeful movements. Um, they could also see staring, uh, lip smacking, falling down without any reason. Uh, they could stiffen up any of their extremities, um, start shaking, which is what we usually think of when we see a seizure, uh, or when we think of seizures. Uh, and then um, seizure activity cannot usually be interrupted with verbal or physical stimulation. They usually just keep going. Uh, the parent or caregiver may report that the child is feeling nauseated, uh, they're feeling weird, uh, they lose control of their bowel or bladder and so they might poop or pee uncontrollably. Um, they might feel numb or tingling at some of their extremities. Uh, and they might say that they smell something weird and they hear something weird. Um, and finally, they could have decreased alertness and level of consciousness. So. Um, what's epilepsy? I'm sure everyone's heard about this before. Epilepsy is basically two or more unprovoked seizures separated by more than 24 hours. Um, essentially, it's basically recurrent unprovoked seizures, seizures that keep occurring without any real triggers or reason over and over again throughout a person's life. Um, 2.9 million people in the U.S. have active, uh, sorry, active epilepsy, and 2.4 million are adults and 460,000 are children. So we've talked about the generalities of seizures, but what are the differences between different types of seizures? Basically, a generalized seizure uh, is an involvement of both cerebral hemispheres and usually involves loss of consciousness. You, you knock out, you don't uh, recall what happened. A focal seizure is, or also known as a partial seizure, is just initial activation of only one part of a cerebral hemisphere. Uh, and it can spread and secondarily generalize, but 
uh, really you think of it as focal, as only one part of your brain. Um, this can have altered levels of consciousness, but you don't completely lose consciousness like you would in a generalized seizure. In addition to that, you might see focal, motor, or sensory signs or symptoms, like there's one part of your extremities that uh, feels tingling, or you can't move it, and it's, but it's not everything. So that's the main difference between those two uh, big umbrellas under seizures. Uh, when we talk about generalized seizures, there are four main types. Uh, absence is a, an abrupt lapse of consciousness lasting a few seconds. So when we talked about um, staring as kind of uh, a type of seizure that one parent could see their kid having, it, it, that's, this usually absence is what we think of in a child. You know, they just start staring uh, and they snap back into it. You know, they can't be stopped. Uh, the teacher might call out to them thinking that they're not paying attention, but really they're having this absence seizure. Um, but again, only lasts a few seconds until they snap back to normal and they don't even realize that they did it. Uh, atonic generalized seizure is an abrupt, unexpected loss of muscle tone. So uh, essentially they could be standing and then boom, have to fall down because they've lost that muscle tone. They can't stand up anymore or they uh, can't uh, tense up their muscles. They can't use that muscle tone that they have usually. Myoclonic um, and tonic are kind of almost uh, the opposite, right? So myoclonic are actually rapid short contractions of one or all extremities. So they'll, they'll keep contracting their muscles and you'll see almost like a, a fasciculation type thing occur um, where the muscles just contracting all the time or rapidly. So it'll contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. Tonic is sustained muscle contraction. So it's not contracting and relaxing, it's just contracting. So it'll, it'll stay really stiff. And you can see an example of this uh, here. Um, so tonic, you can see that the child's back is um, is tense, so they're kind of stretched out like that. Uh, whereas uh, clonic, they're kind of a, a little more flexed, um, or they'll they'll relax and then they'll contract again. And you can see that uh, it's not always flexed all the time. Um, that it's also repeatedly going back and forth. So. You have a kid and uh, they've never had a seizure before and suddenly they are having one. Um, what do you do? How do you go about this? What does this mean? So first of all, when a child has a first unprovoked seizure, we recommend doing an EEG. So um, EEG basically is kind of like this weird brain scan that kind of sees how your brain is uh, working through certain waves and uh, certain specific wave patterns that we can see on the graph uh, indicate a seizure. They help diagnose the event, uh, identify potentially a specific type of seizure or syndrome, and really helps with the prognosis, letting us know whether this is something to really, really worry about or something that may just go away on its own or we can treat conservatively. Um, with the first unprovoked seizure, you might have the child's fast breathing uh, with more exhaling than inhaling. They might report seeing uh, specific visual stimuli, such as flashing lights or patterns. Um, somatosensory stimulation might be activated. They might feel like they, they feel things um, that maybe aren't there or feel weird or tingly. Um, and so sometimes when you want to evaluate it, you want to reenact what you think might be the trigger. It might be reading or low blood sugar or lack of sleep. So these are all things that can trigger uh, a seizure um, that may at first seem unprovoked. And so um, really kind of getting to the bottom of that will also help us with the treatment of this child. Recurrence of uh, unprovoked seizure means uh, another unprovoked seizure after the first one. Usually recurrence ranges from 14 to 65%, which is again is a, it's a big range. And most recurrences occur early, basically in the first year since the first unprovoked seizure. Uh, there are multiple factors that increase recurrence risk, things like uh, an abnormal EEG. Uh, symptomatic seizures have actually a recurrence of greater than 50%. Uh, and then idiopathic seizures, where you're not sure what happened, uh, 30 to 50% recur. Okay. Most children with a first seizure actually have few or no recurrences. Um, on the other hand, however, 10% will have many seizures regardless of initial treatment. Treatment after first 
versus the second seizure does not affect long-term prognosis, and treatment in adults and children leads to decreased recurrences. So that's good. Um, Anticonvulsant treatment, which is basically seizure treatment after a first seizure, must be individualized. You know, uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all. These medications should be um, tailored to the specific patient. Uh, treatment is usually not indicated for prevention of epilepsy, um, but treatment may be considered if risks of recurrent seizures outweigh risks of treatment. So again, with medication, uh, there's always going to be side effects, especially with seizure medications. So it's really got to be weighed. Is this worth it? Um, is this medication side effects worth um, treating these problematic seizures? Um, and again, treatment must obviously take into account patient and family preferences. So we're going to get into a little bit of uh, specific types of pediatric seizures. Febrile seizures are actually the most common seizure disorder in childhood, affecting 2-5% to of children between the ages of 6 months and 5 years. And so with these seizures, they're actually caused by the increase in a core body temperature greater than 100.4, which is a fever. Right, so that's why it's called a febrile seizure. The fever is causing the seizure, and it can occur within t the first 24 hours of uh, any sort of illness that causes a fever. Um, it does not have any central nervous system infection, so no brain stuff really uh, that is viral or bacterial. There's no metabolic disturbances, and typically there's no history of previous seizure disorder. Um, they're typically benign. 33% have at least one recurrence, but for the most part, they don't. Uh, and they could be actually either simple or a complex type of seizure. So um, let's talk about simple versus complex. So simple is generalized, and it lasts less than 15 minutes, whereas a complex is focal, or greater than 15 minutes, or recurrent within 24 hours. Okay. So treatment of a child with simple febrile seizures. Um, so most of the time we do want to treat this conservatively. Uh, once the sickness goes away, the fever goes away, the seizure itself will go away. Uh, but there are some uh, medications that can be treated if it's very severe. Uh, things like uh, phenobarbital, valproic acid, intermittent diazepam. Uh, these are effective in reducing recurrences. But again, just like I said earlier, there are potential toxicities that can occur. So typically we want to treat conservatively as much as possible. So let's talk about more common childhood epilepsy syndromes. Uh, so to begin we'll talk about infantile spasms such as West syndrome. So West syndrome actually occurs uh, from ages 3 to 12 months. They have something called brief uh, jackknife contractions and they occur in uh, something called clusters. They happen when the child is usually awake or when they're drowsy. Um, when you put on the brain uh, scan called the EEG, it'll show something called a hypsarrhythmia on the graph. It'll show basically a high voltage and chaotic background. And so with this, you don't really need to know uh, that specifically. That's just something your doctor will see with the child. Um, with West syndrome, there is developmental regression that begins concurrently with the onset of spasms. So they'll have the spasms and then their developmental um, milestones will actually start to go backwards. So things that they've been able to do uh, as they grow up, they won't be able to do as much or as well. Uh, typically, we don't really know why West syndrome occurs. Uh, most of them are idiopathic cases and the child is normal. So uh, with this, we see that 37% uh, have just normal school and uh, normal um, intelligence and uh, behavior. 43% uh, do have other seizure types. 31% um, can have other neurologic abnormalities. And 6% and, um, uh, death does occur. Next, we'll talk about flexor spasms. Uh, so flexor spasms are actually involuntary muscle contractions comprising of upward flexion at the ankle and flexion at the knees and the hip. And you can see kind of examples of that in this picture here. They occur as a result of pain-related spinal release reflex. When it comes to treatment, uh, you can use ACTH or uh, Um 
but however, data is insufficient to show early treatment or any treatment really changes long-term outcomes. Uh, next is lennox gastrot syndrome. So this is actually a severe form of epilepsy that typically uh, begins between one to five years old. Uh, it consists of several different types of seizures and can cause cognitive dysfunction, developmental delays, and behavioral problems. Uh, and it's caused by a variety of underlying conditions, but sometimes no cause can actually be identified. Um, it can be resistant or refractory, meaning uh, nothing really helps it, to many kinds of anti-seizure medications. So that makes it really difficult to treat. We also have Rolandic epilepsy. Um, this occurs usually 2 to 12 years old and um, peaks at 5 to 10 years old. So again, begins uh, a little bit earlier and then peaks 5 to 10. Infrequent, simple, partial seizures. That's what I want you to think about when you think Rolandic epilepsy. There's tingling in the mouth, uh, on the face, and uh, speech arrest, so they're not able to speak. Um, typically, this resolves by puberty. Treatment is not usually necessary, but it can respond to many drugs if it's very severe. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before, staring spells. Um, so this can be because of a complex partial seizure, absence seizure, uh, or potentially it just might be behavioral staring. It might just be something um, that they... Uh, picked up as a behavior and not necessarily a seizure. Um, again, let's explain what a complex partial seizure is. It begins in one area and then it spreads, but not enough to cause a generalized seizure. Um, staring is often part of the initial spread and it may come with automatisms. Uh, again, automatisms are things like um, lip smacking. Oh, okay. Uh, good thing we have another slide on it right here. They're basically coordinated involuntary movements. Uh, consciousness is impaired, and patient doesn't typically recall the activity. Um, simple includes lip smacking, like I mentioned before, chewing, uttering sounds, uh, picking or tapping, or walking straight or in circles. Uh, complex automatisms where, is where behavior becomes involved. It's not just moving, it's, it's undressing, chewing inedible objects, wandering, and being aggressive. Uh, in addition to that, we also have uh, absence syndrome, uh, again, which we touched on before. This usually occurs from four to six years old. Many seizures uh, daily, and but the seizures only last a few seconds. Um, as I've said, the patient doesn't realize that they've had the seizure. They just um, stare and then snap back in, not even realizing what happened. 70%, uh, over 70%, have associated automatisms, things like eye f eyelid flutter, uh, simple vocalizations, uh, picking movements, uh, but the majority resolved by adolescence. Behavioral staring. Uh, as mentioned before, this is just them staring, uh, not necessarily a seizure. It's most commonly seen in children with ADHD, pervasive developmental disorder, or uh, general intellectual in instability. It occurs when they're bored or when they're overstimulated and it can be stopped with close contact or stimulation. So now we've talked a little bit about what a seizure is, what it can be, the types there are. Uh, what do you do when your child has a seizure? Uh, the most important thing is to place the child in a safe place where they cannot get hurt. Typically this will mean the floor, preferably on their right side. Uh, you want to remove any nearby objects that could potentially hurt them while they're having the seizure. Make sure there's no tight clothing around their head and neck, and do not try to keep the child's mouth open with any objects and do not try to restrain their movement. This will only just hurt them. Once the seizure is over, uh, take care of the child, keeping them lying down until they have fully recovered. The kids will often be in what's called a post-ictal phase where they're tired and confused and they may actually just fall asleep. Uh, only give them food and drink if they awaken and are fully alert. If this is their first uh, unexplained seizure, it's good to call your doctor or uh, emergency medical services for instruction and evaluation as soon as possible. Um, for those who are parents or caregivers, if you want to prevent injury during a seizure, uh, as mentioned before, move those nearby objects out of the way, position child while seizing in a side-lying position, protect their head from injury, prevent injury from falls, and reassure the child during the event. Stay with them. and can't reinforce this enough, do not place anything in the child's mouth. Status epilepticus. So 
A status epilepticus is a continuous seizure that lasts greater than five minutes. Uh, it's basically two or more sequential seizures without full recovery of consciousness between seizures. Um, this is life-threatening, it's very serious, and requires immediate intervention and treatment. Call 911 if this is going on. Commonly occurs in children with epilepsy, 10-30% uh, over time. Uh, complications from the impact of the convulsive state on the body, uh, including heart and lungs, and a ronal cellular injury, which leads to cell death. So this can really mess up the person's insides in terms of their organs and their brain function. Uh, again, this is why you want to call 911 as soon as possible. Rapid termination of the seizure activity protects against neuronal injury. Again, call 911. Okay. So what steps should you take and what priorities are there when you see a child have status epilepticus? As I've mentioned before, call 911. That's the first thing you should do. Uh, second, do the parents have any anticonvulsant medications? Uh, for example, rectal diazepam. This can definitely help during status epilepticus. So you want to give them, uh, give the child uh, this medication within five minutes of uh, the start of the status epilepticus. Third, check are they breathing? Do they need CPR? Um, fourth, place them in the recovery position again, side lying. Fifth. Nasal midazolam. This can actually help. It's a rescue medication for children refractory to rectal diazepam. Um, in addition to that, there's also different medication treatment options for epilepsy. Uh, these types of medications, again, they need to be tailored to the specific patient. Things like type, frequency, and severity of the seizures. Uh, side effects, titration, drug interactions, dosing, forms, cost of drugs, that's more medication related. That's something, again, we have to weigh whether or not it's worth it uh, based on the symptoms, whether the child that needs to undergo the risk of these side effects or the parents have to go through the cost of these drugs in order to treat their epilepsy. Um, and again, also just neurologists, right? The doctor, uh, the doctor's own preference based on their experience, based on what they've seen, based on what they know about the drugs, um, that will also play a role in what medication is used for epilepsy. Going to more detail about the medication effects, um, there can be wanted and unwanted effects on the target organ. Um, you always want to weigh, again, efficacy, uh, whether it can control the seizure and how well it can do that versus toxicity. Uh, so adverse effects like dizziness, uh, ataxia, nausea, and many others. Um, in terms of side effects, neurologic and psychiatric are usually the most common. Things like sedation, so you feel sleepy, fatigue, unsteadiness, um, incoordination, dizziness, and then tremors, so just a little shaking. You can also get paresthesias. Uh, these are common in topiramate and zonisamide. Um, basically, you feel some numbness. You don't feel as well, um, sense-wise. Uh, diplopia, blurred vision, visual distortion. So basically, you're not able to see as well. This can happen with carbamazepine and lamotrigine. Uh, mental or motor slowing or impairment can occur with topiramate. Uh, basically, you're not able to think as quickly. Um, mood or behavioral changes can happen with levetiracetam. Um, Changes in libido or sexual function can occur with carbamazepine, phenytoin, and phenobarbital. Weight gain and appetite changes can occur with the following medications here. And also weight loss can occur depending on the medications if you're taking these medications here as well. Now to wrap it up, now that we're at the end of our presentation, I just want to summarize everything that we've learned today. Uh, seizures are abnormal movements such as shaking due to abnormal neuronal activity. There are a wide variety of different types of seizures. And when a child has a seizure, make sure they are in a safe place, preferably on their side, and comfort them when they recover. Um, again, if they have status epilepticus, if it's going for a long, for a long time, please call 911. Uh, other than that, there are many different treatment modalities that are available, but you always have to weigh whether it's worth um, giving them the risk of toxicities and side effects. And here are our references. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you learned from this presentation. And I uh, hope you guys have a great day. Thank you.